Hello, this is Dr. Snootopia back from the state of India. It's the largest democracy in the world, and I got so much information, knowledge, and wisdom from my travels there. But before I really get into my trip to India, I just want to have a moment to just thank you for watching this show. Thank Access Tucson for being here. We need community TV. That's something that you don't see in every nation state is community TV. We are so fortunate that we have a voice here, that we can talk about radical and revolutionary ideas. Ideas that I heard a lot about when I was in India. The whole world is on the verge of worldwide revolution. And let's hope that it is based in evolutionary consciousness that really makes the individual free. And that also it, well, any revolution has got to be a collective change. That's what revolution is all about. It's hard to have a revolution of one. And once you have the revolutionary consciousness, you need to connect with other people. And that's when you start having the ability to have collective power. So I'm going to start a slideshow here. What can we learn from the Gandhi legacy? Because when I was in India, for two weeks I was on a tour about Gandhi's legacy. This is Mahatma Gandhi. He has, is known as the father of India because he is the one who helped create a revolution against the British. Now, I was looking at this tour that I took on Gandhi's legacy through the eyes of somebody who had spent a month at the Occupy movement here in Tucson. And so I went with wanting to know what the Gandhian thought was that created such a revolutionary movement against the British. Now, I really feel that we are up against the same empire. We did not get rid of the British Empire. And what I mean by that is it just kind of changed systems. There were some uh, liberation that happened from the British, but basically the American system was the same European system based on ownership of property, and based on uh, other European ways of living, habits of the Europeans. So what we're trying to do is break these habits. We're trying to go into a different system, and that's what Gan Gandhian revolution was all about. He was a utopian, which, of course, I can identify with that. Uh, and every revolution needs its utopian vision. That's how we get out of the crisis, is by having a vision of where we want to go. So my journey started out in going from New York to Chennai, India, which used to be Madras. Well, let me say a couple of words about flying. I realized that taking a flight overseas to the other side of the world means that I have a huge environmental blueprint. Anybody that does air travel, you are burning up so much uh, CO2 that's causing the planet to become hotter and hotter and hotter and less, less livable. So we have to decide in our minds whether this travel is going to bring back the information we need to transform the local and that's what I'm hoping. I just want to give a minute of silence here, hoping that I say the correct words to you so that my trip across the world was not in vain, that I brought back something significant that needs to be heard to the Occupy movement uh, that is, helps us grow into a movement against empire. So just a moment here. And I'm going into planetary consciousness. 
I'm seeing my, my spine is straightening, straightening up and it's being connected with the cosmos, the central sun of the spiraling ga galaxy. So this is a meditation I am doing to help ground me so that I will know what to say to you. And then on the other side of the planet is Mu Mumbai. I eventually got to Mumbai. I will talk later about my trip to southern India, but this is really about the Gandhi part of the trip. And it started out, the tour started in Mumbai. Now that, they've changed the name. It used to be Bombay. And it's on the bay uh, of uh, the Arabic Sea, Arabian Sea. And it is a huge metropolitan area, a megalopolis. And you will see that if you go there, that you have the rich and the poor living side by side, uh, even more so than in New York City. So it's a huge city of more than 20,000 people, just as big as Cairo. And some people are saying that it too is on the verge of a revolution because the Gandhian revolution did not occur, which is a real tragedy for the world. It was stopped because of the assassination. And here, this was taken out of the window of a bus when we were going on a tour of the city. And our tour guide informed us that even though it looks like these people are living in slums, that they really aren't. They have money, they have jobs, they're middle class, but they can't afford to make that step into renting a, an apartment uh, somewhere in a, one of those skyscrapers that you saw. Uh, because they just don't have the capital to do that. So even though that they have a job and they're middle class, they still cannot get decent housing. And when we really get down to it, this whole global crisis and certainly the local crisis of foreclosure, it's all about housing, which I, I have been continuously talking about on this show about the importance of architecture in getting us out of this crisis and that our crisis is also a result of having inadequate architecture that builds sustainability, that builds community, that brings us together. What we see is a society that we have designed to keep us apart. So the first uh, place that we went where Gandhi spent time was this Mani Bhavan. And it was a household, it's two stories, of a friend of his who was a rich jeweler in Mumbai. And he, a lot of initiations of his movement started in this place. And I'm just going to talk about a few of them. First of all, there is no religion higher than truth and righteousness. What, what I'm focusing on with Gandhi is looking at his consciousness, uh, his religion, his belief system, that to me is the fundamentally the most important aspect of who he was. This, what he called, they finally called him great soul, the Mahatma. Uh, let's understand that soul. How do we ourselves become that soul needed to create global transformation and have this force that is fearless against empire? Uh, this is actually the front of this house. It's in a very a kind of exclusive part of Mumbai. And up on the second floor is where he actually lived. And at one time, you can kind of see the balcony up there. He was arrested there. He was put in jail uh, another time and lasted up to six years for sedition. And the other uh, revolutionary that I studied while in 
while in India, uh, or a bendo, was also in prison for sedition. This is what they get you for, seditions. And at one point we saw a film about Gandhi and he said his religion was revolution. And let's just think about that for a moment. Your religion is revolution. Uh, so I think my religion is revolution as well. And what I mean by that is that you become so devoted to this idea of transforming the world so there is no more poverty, so that there is no more pollution, that we live with sanitation, that health care is available for all. That is our, the most religious thing we could do. That will uh, lift up everyone's soul. So I think my religion is also revolution. And you could say that Christ was also a revolutionary. He went up against empire. It's these great souls who have some kind of key to how we do it. <clears throat> this is the room that Gandhi actually stayed in. It's glassed off, so I could just take a photograph of it from outside the glass area. Now, there is a beautiful story about this, and it deals with uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He had won the Nobel Peace Prize, and he was coming to India to talk about his journey with truth. And when he got off the airplane, he got the people who were hosting him uh, to take him to this museum, which is the, the room that I showed you is actually in a museum now. They turned that house into a museum. So King wanted to go to the museum right stepping off the plane. So they took him there, and once he got into the museum, he told the director, could he just have an hour to meditate in that glassed off room? And so they said, yes, they let him in. He meditated for one hour at, in Gandhi's room. And then he, after his meditation, he got up and he said, I feel the presence of Gandhi and I want to stay here during my journey to Mumbai. So of course they were going, well, you know, it's a museum. Nobody stays here. Uh, and they didn't know what to do. They had rented him a beautiful room in a fancy hotel, but he didn't want that. So what the director of the museum did was they got a cot and they put it in the storeroom and then uh, King was able to, after his lectures, to come and stay uh, in the place where Gandhi lived. So it, that's just such a touching story to me. And this is what he actually said about Gandhi. The intellectual and moral satisfaction that I failed to gain from the utilitarianism of Bentham and Mill, the revolutionary method of Marx and Lenin, the social contract theory of Hobbes, the back to nature optimism of Rousseau, the Superman philosophy of Nietzsche, I found in the nonviolent resistant philosophy of Gandhi. So both of these religious men see that the nonviolence philosophy is the way that we find both inner peace and the way to resist the empire. Now, why is that? I really feel it is because it takes a certain amount of self-control, self-discipline, understanding yourself in order to resist any of the aggressive behaviors that many of us have. So it takes a certain education of the self in order to have a nonviolence movement. 
Now, like King, Gandhi also had a vision. And to me, it's a very similar dream. I can't read that, so I'm not going to even try. But I will just say about his dream, it is this universal dream that we, in poverty, that once we do, then we can have small militaries. We're not exploiting, or are we being exploited because we have this workers' rights? We don't have a class warfare going on because we live in an egalitarian society of what Gandhi called self-rule. He wanted to get rid of this whole concept of class, uh, caste system. And the caste system in India, you know, my understanding of it is, is it deals more with profession. It's certain professions that were called untouchable. It was the people who worked in the, uh, with, in the latrines. They were the untouchable class. And they were born into these kind of heredity uh, professions. Uh, and that's why uh, they were looked down upon, because they were just these common workers who uh, just had the lowest level uh, status jobs. And so people didn't want to be associated with them. So Gandhi was very against this. And I love this quote, we are all one, because in India, there are just a, you know, it's like the hotbed of religion in India. So you will see Jains, you will see Hindus, you will see uh, Muslims, you will see Christians. Uh, the, all of the religions of the world, Bud Buddhism is very significant in India. So how do they all get along? And so how do they all unite? That was one of Gandhi's big problems is how do you create this unity? Now, this is a very much of a problem within Occupy too. How do we create this unity of ideas, of ideology, so that we can have this uh, commonality, that we are not all Americans at this point, but that we are all global citizens? I think this is one of the changes since the Gandhian revolution that we're faced with, is that now it's like we are all earthlings. That's our quest beyond nationalism to seeing the common problems that all of the ecology is one. There is one ocean. Um, think of all the mountain ranges as, as stemming from the same basic crust of the earth. Uh, and then we start understanding this global consciousness. And for those of you who have had the fortune of traveling, you realize that uh, after a while, everyone's human. We all have our basic human needs that need to be met. Now, the expression of these different cultures is different, and that's just part of um, how the world works. This week, there's the gym show, and uh, if I went around to look at some of the, the stones, and the diversity of this planet and just the stones alone is 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 just remarkable and fantastic. And you realize that everyone, each of us is a different stone. We're cut a little bit differently. Some of us are more polished than others. And some of us are, are rough. But that's our challenge, is to be the gemstone so that the light can shine through it uh, and be able to cast this beautiful rainbow effect on people. So I love this quote. Uh, uh, he says, whenever you are in doubt or when the self becomes too much with you, apply the following test. Recall the face of the poorest and the weakest man whom you have seen and ask yourself if the step you contemplate is going to be of any use to him. Will he gain anything by it? 
Will it restore him to a control over his own life and destiny? In other words, will it lead to self-rule for the hungry and spiritually starving millions? When, then you will find your doubts and yourself melting away. So, I love that quote. If we could all just live by that. When you wonder whether you should buy something or indulge in this or that, or how you should spend your time, either, even if it's uh, what television show you're watching. If you say to yourself, look at that poorest person on the street, and we have plenty of homeless people here in, uh, in the United States, Think of that face of that poor and weak person and say, is this going to help that person? And then you will know whether or not to purchase that thing, to buy that, that, um, those clothes. That's such a great test. Uh, it, and there's a morality to this. There's a morality to the revolution. And that's what King and Gandhi and Jesus and Buddha and all of the other saints have been trying to tell us that in order to have this revolution that has been going on for thousands of years, since the beginning of the consciousness of goodness, that we have been on the verge of this great transformation where we actually start living as sisters and brothers in this global neighborhood as a, a village of the local. <clears throat> Mahatma Gandhi never had more than 100 persons absolutely committed to his philosophy. But with this small group of devoted followers, he galvanized the whole of India and through a magnificent feat of nonviolence, challenged the might of the British Empire and won freedom for his people. Well, we have such a... Um, a wealth of knowledge of how to do this. The problem is just doing it. Now, today as I speak, there is a new Occupy uh, that has formed around the uh, Stone Speedway Park. And I urge you to go down there, to join it. Now, Gandhi knew that not everyone had the time the ability to join his, his ashram system. He knew, though, that everyone, since you are part of humanity, have some role to play in this great work, in this transformation movement. So I'm urging you here to figure out, ask that question about how you can help the poor and the weakest person that you see in your mind's eye and what you're going to do for our movement, the Occupy movement, because this is really where our test lies, is if we can find the unity within all of our surrounding chaos. Our cities are so chaotic. It's very hard to center. It's very hard to hear that music inside, that inner wisdom, because there's so much out there. And we're always going to the phone or uh, going to the computer. There's so much information out there. But the only information that will really uh, save humanity and uplift us to this divine consciousness of evolution is by this um, this spiritual change within us. So you can see I was greatly affected by India. 
or I'm more convinced in this uh, way of being. I thank you so much for being on the being here with me on this show.